Yeah. It's gonna be done. I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks. Started. Yeah. So, but I mean, I've gotten drafts of every chapter except for the final chapter. Just rich and got feedback, so I mean, like, every chapter's drafted now. So that's Progress. Yes. Maybe I'll just sit and get back to the office. There's some help. Regarding the time of your going and I'll turn off the music. One quick announcement before we start. Again, we have these active teaching in using active learning in the classroom. Uh, blended learning toolkits available. You can take them. These are last year's edition, so huge closeout sale on the old ones. <laughs> They're free for the taking. Um, if you find them useful, 
this is a fellowship that is offered almost every year, if not every year. So look for that, um, and you'll get information on it on the blendedtoolkit.com or blendedtoolkit.com. But available and good stuff available there. Welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. My name is John Martin. I work for Dewey Academic Technology as part of the Teaching Academy, and um, we try to get people to come every week and talk about their experiences using technology to teach. Sometimes teach better. Sometimes it's about the frustrations of using technology to teach. That's okay. We problem solve and work through some things, um, and hopefully you leave having some questions answered that you had when you came in. Which gets us to our first part of the hour, and that is what we do is we want to be responsive to your needs, so we're going to go around the room and have you tell us who you are and why you came here, but we're going to do it a little bit differently this time. We're going to do it like an online discussion, <laughs> so you have to say something. It should be 200 char 250 <laughs> characters about, give or take, no more than 500 characters, and then two more responses to other people's <laughs> so if we can just make that all happen, we'll have a, a very effective face-to-face uh, -face communication based on online uh, practices. All right. Um, so who would like to start? Oh, I'm going to point out a few more things. Actually, on the activity sheet in this top box here, you can see the top box here. There is a link you can enroll in to get to the Canvas page. The reason you'd want to get to the Canvas page is because in the Canvas page, we have the worksheet, the activity sheet, embedded there. And there's a link to it as well, right here above it. And it's open to anyone to add to. So at the very bottom of it, you can see that there's a lot of information. You can add your own questions and your own resources. So if you have a particularly cool resource that you would like to share, on online discussions, please share it with us so that our next lab can be even better. Um, the other thing, of course, the paper sheets, the links don't work on the paper sheets, but they do work on the digital sheet, so that's nice. All right. So you're going to tell me why you're here, and I'm going to write some questions down so that we can make sure that we try to respond to those questions um, today. Who'd like to start? Who are you? Why are you here? Start. All right, Karen. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Taylor. I work at TCS and work with someone else in the room. Um, <laughs> teach online at UW. Um, anyway, I have a lot of experience with online teaching, online discussions. Um, do you want me to give you a question too? If you have a, a question you'd like to ask to get us addressed today, yes. What are some strategies for making online discussions organic? Organic, ooh, certified. Wait, is that registered? It's not registered, trademark. Okay, great. Charles, do you like to call them? Sure. Um, hey everyone, I'm Charles. I'm in the Department of Professional Design, and I work with so, um, I'm also just curious about how to make um, online discussions um, not only effective for school hearing, but also a bit more personable because it seems like um, an online class that's just kind of seeing random people. It's very small. All right, I like personable. Sarah? Yep, I'm in the Department of French and Italian also. Um, I'm not teaching anything right now, um, but I am very interested in my or like blended things, and discussions are definitely interesting to me because of the lack of like face to face, you know, like re reconceptualizing like interpersonal relationships through a discussion board. So I just have general, I'm just here to glean general. Information about that? In some ways, uh, you talked about relationships, and and so I think that that kind of yeah. builds off of Charles' question about how do we make them personable, how do we make them relationships instead of sort of this anonymous online space. 
I should note, none of you have thus far responded to two other posts that people have given us. I'm afraid, well, if there's time, and we're going to end this at like quarter after, but if there's time, you'll be able to go in afterwards, but you have to re-log in, of course, and in order for there to be content for you to get posts on. Very good. All right, Duncan. Hi, Duncan Carlson with the Survey Stack. I'm going to teach an online class that I used to have but you use both Piazza and Canvas discussions. Excellent. Yeah, and, and feedback in a one on one discussion for assignments. And um, I'm already, you know, asking the students questions I haven't been doing that and like responding with the meeting conversation as well. Okay. And it's hard to keep up with that as well, and we'll get into that as well. Um, welcome to Eleni online and if she wants to type something up, I'll have JT read it. JT, why are you here? Or or if you have any questions I'm gonna respond to. <laughs> I'm um, JT, French Italian as well, and Food Active Technology. I would like to know if people use discussion as a way to get the discussion started, or is it to continue the discussion from an in person or in face to face class? So, is it a before or after? Yeah, is it to kick things off or to let things continue on? Very good. I don't have your name. Eric Yen from the Department of National Sciences. I'm particularly interested in how do you have an organic discussion and yet focus students on learning objectives? So, tied to the learning objectives without being too forced. Very good. Choco. Uh, my name is Choco Miyagi, and I'm with the Eric System. Mine is more compliance training, medically compliance stuff. So is there a way to add this to that? To compliance training, which is generally individual work rather than social work, social learning. Great. Margaret, any questions we should address? Uh, no, Margaret, I think we covered that. I think having it to be um, more authentic is like a key move. Sometimes it's just like the social. Yeah. Yeah, the culture reading, the any statement, just Yeah, it's sort of the not, how to not force it. I think it's really just to read the dialogue. Okay, yeah. excellent. Yeah, and I'd like to get, I'd uh, like to give a little feedback on yours. I would agree with what you said. Do I get an extra point for <laughs> <laughs> that? Right. Ah, yeah, because anytime you say, yeah, good point, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that checks off the box. Okay. I agree too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, no, I'm done. Chad. Hi, I'm Jen Russo. I'm from the UW Extended Campus. I'm a new associate instructional designer, so this is my first time working with faculty on developing their online courses. So I came here just to get a general sense of what other people are doing and then how um, instructors can best manage the online discussion and be present. All right, and the, the instructor presence is, a, a, I'm not, that's what I'm going to write down. Just double check, an extended campus is all online, correct? Yes. Okay, very good. Ben. Hi, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm a grad student in genetics. Um, I'm interested in teaching in the future, which is why I'm here. Um, and I guess, you know, as a recent student, I had some online discussions. <laughs> I have agreed with lots of the don'ts on this. <laughs> you have opinions, too. Yeah. So, so I, I think I'm most interested, um, like he was saying, trying to get learning objectives addressed. Very good. Andrew? Hello. I am Andrew Turner. I'm here on um, behalf of William UW now, as you see. Um, and this is an initial prospect. I'll be familiar with that. Um, let's see. I'm interested in learning about what other tools people use for discussions. Great. Do you use any outside of Canvas? Outside of Canvas and Piazza, we've already mentioned. Are there others? I'd like to know that too. Very good. Jamie? Hi, I'm Jamie. I am a PhD student in the School of Social Work. Um, I also teach as part of an online master's program in palliative care specifically for the uh, University of Maryland. Okay. Um, and um, I guess my biggest question is, how do you effectively provide feedback in an online discussion forum because tone is not there? Um, so how do you gently provide feedback without? 
sending. Yeah. Students. No nonverbals. How do we exactly. do that? How do we navigate? Very good. Corey? My name is Corey Schmidt-Bauer, and I'm a new instructional designer with Google Academic Technology. It's my first week here. So <laughs> I'm here. Well, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm a background in instructional design and with online course development and curriculum. I also have teaching experience. I've taught rhetoric classes face to face as well as online. So this is a good discussion to have about discussions. So um, I think a lot of people covered <laughs> good topics, but my question is, is how do we encourage the students to participate promptly? So mm -hmm. basically time management. Mm -hmm. And um, that's probably the two the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean, everything. Yeah, it's uh, and we joked about you have to respond to two things, and of course, Karen has the first one, doesn't have two other things to respond to, so she's in there, and you know, a lot of our students, they parachute in, and then they just never come back, mm -hmm. unless they have to, and then, oh, I have to now, but yeah, very good. Um, Armilla. I have no original content, I'm Armilla, mm -hmm. um, but I would like to comment on how <laughs> and say I agree with Thank you, first of all, like bringing the classroom feel to a discussion and also Andrew about other um, tools, digital tools that we use. All right, very good. And Peter? Um, I'm Peter Van Ken. I um, teach in the kinesiology department on neuroscience related issues. And I, you know, like the question I've been struggling with over the past couple of years is how to have team based discussion organized so that everybody in class can profit by it, you know, but can profit from the knowledge obtained. So the sharing between kind of like the teams and the, and the bigger um, uh, enrollment of the whole class. <coughs> Good. I like, I like the use of teams instead of groups, but un we understand that the two, right, because if you have a small discussion among yourselves, it's just among yourselves. How do we get that then shared out with everyone else? Excellent. Yeah, um, yeah um, my name is Mohamed Atay. I'm the history program, a PhD candidate. And uh, I'm going to teach an online course on modern LEs this summer. So I'm interested in using digital tools uh, to have an effective uh, discussion online. All right. Yes. Yep. Move. Try to help. And <laughs> I'm Leah Freeman. I am a librarian, um, so I'm just kind of here to to see what's going on, especially as like a lot of the classes for undergrads are moving towards the online space in the libraries. We're thinking about how we can still support those. Um, so, okay, very good. Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Silver. I'm the other person that Karen was referring to in order to facilitate Teach Online, you have to be named Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so other than that, I'm just here because we just had a session on discussions and the program if you're interested in Teach Online, see one of us Karen's uh, and one of their you know, big comments was ugh. <laughs> and a lot of other negative comments. So I'd like to see how how we can turn those negatives into positives and you know what are some of the negative things which I'm already starting to hear uh, that we can change those things. All right, how to deal with the UGS. <laughs> Todd Lundberg, I work with uh, the Collaborative for Advancing Teaching and Learning. And my question is, it's related to Peter's um, and it's really about team-based learning. Who's using discussion boards as a way of doing a kind of simultaneous report out yeah, and I'm interested not in online, I'm interested in face-to-face, -face. actually using discussion forums as a way of getting an electronic simultaneous report out um, that then that, that teams and the whole class can use and you can use in discussion. I'm going to put it as a big topic, face-to-face -to -face versus online. And I know that that's sort of a, there are more specifics than that. Spoiler alert, we're not going to get to a lot of the specifics today, but we're going to hopefully, um, if you know of things that are being addressed here and you're like, oh, I have the answer to that, we're going to please, please share forward. Naomi. Um, I'm Naomi. I'm also with the Collaborative for Advancing Learning and Teaching. Um, I, uh, am, my background is in teaching writing, and so I'm interested in how other people teach students about discussions posts and effective discussion posts as like a genre like it's it's a kind of thing you can learn to like how we teach them to write productive online discussion posts that aren't i agree 
Yeah, very good. Writing versus discussion. They are different, right? All right, Lenny. Uh, members will instruct our feedback on discussion posts. In the past, I commented on student posts, but it can get unwieldy and effective at commenting on every single student's comments. All right, so I'm going to put that under not instructor presence and workload. Let's make it just, you know, versus instructor workload because the more present you are, the more work it is. And organization. Not successfully, and some successfully. But I'm still on this this semester seems to be uh, doing better, so I can share some of the things I've been doing. But I'm still uh, wondering about my role as an instructor. What 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 is it? Should I give feedback? What kind of kind of feedback? All right, very good, Kenny. Uh, I'm a student in the kinesiology uh, department, and uh, a couple of topics have already come up that I'm interested in, including the instructor presence and workload. I've worked with like 100 plus, 200 plus classes in the past, and there's been some desire to get online discussions into those classes, but as the single TA for those classes, I provided a lot of <laughs> because, because, like you said, what is my role in commenting and providing feedback on those? Just, I, I usually wait till we're all done and then we start addressing things, but just show of hands, how many of you have tried to do discussions like, like with 100 people at a time in one group? How did that, well, all right, we're going we're gonna to talk to you later on, but let me get back over here. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, I work with John Gary on program number of large and uh, John would know that I'm very cynical about discussion boards. Technology in general. <laughs> <laughs> in the 90s when they were the thing, and that's hard to question. But I'm going to stay away from my cynicism and say what I'm interested in is I know that they can be used well. I know that they're highly effective for use of it. I've been felt that way. And I'm curious how people judge that effect. What are your criteria? Yeah, that would work. Wow, that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Ye
My question is, I get why we say you must respond to at least two of your classmates. Um, and make sure not to respond to somebody that's already been responded. I get why we do all that, but how do we get them to post initially some kind of post that engages them enough that they want to do that and they're not paying attention to the number, but rather the quality and the interest in there? Um, so we're looking at intrinsic motivation. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm Molly. I'm a postdoc in psychology um, and new to working at UW, so I'm kind of just learning what people are doing here. We might be moving into an online course world, so checking it all out. All right, and Cliff. My name is Cliff. Work with Learn at UW. Um, do a lot of support for various Canvas type products. Um, and I'm here for the cookie, John. Very good. <laughs> so, I know that's on your sheet. Okay, we have. Um, <laughs> Now that took 25 minutes to go around the room and do that. Colossal waste of time or some sense of now I understand that I'm not alone with my concerns here, the new ideas here, oh, flip grids, things are starting to happen already. There's a lot of information on this sheet as far as the, the technical elements of it. Um, we've got instructions on that. We're not going to talk about how to open up Canvas and how to set this button and how to create groups. There's great stuff online, self-paced video, step-by-step text-based, a lot of good stuff online. We're not going to do that. <clears throat> I want to get into this stuff about how do we make it organic. And we started off with let's make this an online discussion by forcing you and if, if Students won't do it unless it's right. right. So that's why we do that, right? And why? And that's why it's right, but why? Um, because we need to have grades, right? That's the system that we live in. Yay, go team. Um, how can we make it organic? Who has had an organic <laughs> online discussion in or out of school? So what does it look like and what made it organic? I see your hand raised. Yes, Kurt. Um, I think that first, first of all, not to have a prompt that's a fact-based prompt. I think it's a little up. Give an example of that. What does the author define X as? Okay. Because <laughs> that's just. Uh, but a better one might be: How does your author define X, and what are other people saying about X? So, so taking something and adding more to it. But, yeah. yeah. So, so not making so making the prompts themselves have flexibility in response to opportunities. Um, there's something else I was going to say about that. Oh, interest, interest-based groupings. I guess finding a way to put students together who share interests. And in some ways, we're talking about teams now. How do we have the different teams? So groups. How many of you have done groups online? Do you do individual group? I'm oh, sorry. Short term groups, so each week you get a new group, or do you let them develop a relationship over the first half of the semester? Or the whole semester? So I've, I've heard that, I've heard pros and cons to a lot of these, right? Um, the pro for a longer term thing is to get to know each other, right? The con for all semester is what if I don't like the people that I'm in the group with? Um, switching it up half and half seems to be a, a compromise. Short term, one week you're with this group, another week you're with this group. Sure, you get a lot of ideas, or do you because you don't have that trust built yet? So you might not get any ideas. It all might stay superficial up here. Um, good prompts are another part. We got some really good discussions from this article here that Mark Kurzweilers put together, um, as well as some very specific um, prompts. And there, are, and there are more out there. There's a lot of resources here. Okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and I don't think I don't think it's a 
So I mean, hang on, hang on with that one because I want to I want to focus on that. Is the discussion that you're doing? This is what I'm, I'm picking up. The discussion assignment is builds on another assignment, so it becomes a scaffolded piece of a bigger assignment. And the reason then for doing it is not just for the grade or because they were assigned to do it, but because Whatever they do there is going to help them with this bigger end of semester that's project. In terms of that structure. Yeah, that's another great way of doing it. In my case, it's about the authority experience. That's really what I want. I don't want them to learn this thing. So there's a little bit of something there. And you also have them find the research so they can choose which source they, they need to cite from the previous one. Good. Other thoughts on that? And I want to, um, I want to get back to Naomi's <coughs> thought on Writing. So, online discussion. We call them online discussions. But what are they really? They're they're writing, right? And writing and the voices that we use in writing are very different from the voices that we use in discussions. The grammar is different. Everything's different about it. And now, you know, how many of you have had discussions here where they are using the emojis <coughs> and the short. Uh, BRBs and, and whatever they're doing these days. It's hard to keep up as a old guy. Um, it's part of it. Is that okay? Or do you like check for grammar and make sure that it's formal Queen, Queen's English or whatever? Should you? Because is that part of an authentic discussion? Or is it just part of authentic writing? In which case, why in Canvas do we call it discussions? <laughs> How many of you are familiar with the SAMR model? S-A-M-R. So SAMR, yes, stands for substitution, right? We get a new technology and we say, oh, I can do this here. We've got this online environment. Let's substitute discussions, face-to-face, -face, nonverbals, all of these things that we have a list of. And you can add to this if you'd like. What are the differences between face-to-face -face versus online? There are some affordances that there are in this medium, some affordances in this medium, they're different. But what can we do to substitute, right? The A is augmentation. Oh, it seems like in the online environment I can have them do research and add links. Well, that's going to do that. You can't do that in a face-to-face -face thing. I make a point and they say, oh, that's uh, HTTP colon slash slash <laughs> da -da 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 com or dot <coughs> or whatever it is. Um, augmentation is the next one. The next thing we get to is the M, modification. How can we modify this? Thank you. And in that case, it, it becomes something sort of different, right? It's not just a discussion. It's a, it's a, what would be a good example of a discussion that is modified by being online? You've got the augmentation of um, links, but maybe we're not even going to uh, have a discussion. Maybe it's just going to be a sharing of YouTube videos explaining the concept and different things. So it's not really a discussion. It's a totally different thing, modified. And then R. Or modify. Modify. That's right. And then R is redefined. So we're not even calling it online discussions anymore. It's an online exchange. It's an online forum. They started off as forums, and somehow they <coughs> turned into discussions. Um, I don't know why that happened. I think because we're still sort of in that substitution phase. So what are some ways that you have seen discussions sort of transformed or various elements of this? Use, use things like webinars instead. You don't have to do it all text-based in an online course. You can also use webinars. Canvas, you can do synchronous face-to-face um, -face video discussions with Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, right? They can have their own whiteboards. They can draw pictures in there. They, that can be a synchronous discussion, synchronous at the same time, versus the asynchronous. I log in. I'm the only one there. I can't respond to anybody's posts yet because nobody's posted anything. It's kind of echo. It's not very personable in there. It's certainly not a conversation other than 
you know, if you're in the elevator and you say something and then you get off the elevator and somebody comes in to <coughs> hear you, to the echoes of you, um, not a discussion. What other um, things have you seen where uh, in an images augmentation, right? We can add images. Mm -hmm. How about modifications? Have any of you seen a really uh, interesting use of the Canvas discussion forum? Q&A. Q&A? Back and forth, <clears throat> ask me anything. Sarah? Kind of like an ongoing final project page. You could edit your posts. So, so students, students will like essentially build a forum of consecutive like blog entries. Yeah. But then they can go back and edit it over time. You can leave comments as a form of peer review or feedback. And Piazza is a really great example of a modified <coughs> or even redefined discussion forum, isn't it? How many of you have used Piazza? It has, yes, a couple of people. If you haven't, take a look at it. There are some really good examples of it being used. The thing about Piazza is that you can set it up as an instructor so that it's anonymous from student to student, so that students don't feel the pressure of, oh, this is a really dumb question. They can put it in anyway and say, I'm anonymous. I don't know this answer. And somebody else can come in and say, oh, I know the answer. I'm going to build some social capital. My name is John, and I say, here's the answer. And you go, ooh, John's so smart. <laughs> Which you do all the time. Right? Karen? Uh, take us back to the writing point as well. I use uh, the Canvas forums for when I taught a, a COMD course, a writing intensive course. So during a face-to-face -face session, I had students log into Canvas and go to the forum. And the goal was for them to work on their paraphrasing abilities. Uh -huh. So they were supposed to have read an uh, article. And at, I told them they couldn't use their material. They had five minutes. And they all started a reply. And they were supposed to write one paragraph kind of summarizing the main idea. Great. And so they did that during class time and then and all at the same time. So they weren't able to see each other while they were typing either. And, uh, and then they posted that, and then they <coughs> talked about it as a class. But they were also preserved, so they could see how others had approached it, and kind of still be able to use that again when they wrote the paper. And so that's it's a great example of, of a, a modification or re redefinition of that online forum, using it as sort of the muddiest point, or using it as a minute paper, or some other sort of thing where it's there, they can see each other's after they do it, so they're not doing, oh yeah, same, same. Um, everybody does an individual one. They can go back and refer to it afterwards. It's a, a very good example. Thank you. Uh, so yes, Shoko. Kind of, the the Can you kind of close that So it's, it's, well, it's, 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 it's the difference between the online versus the face to face. It's part of the work. We're, we're trying to force a face to face discussion into this online format because we're substituting. We oftentimes just get stuck on this. Oh, we're going to have a discussion. We can call it a discussion. It should be called an online forum because, because the online forum lets us do these other things to it, in it, within it. Dan? I, I want to um, follow up on what, what Sarah said. I, I like the this idea of using it as a sort of open blog. And one of the reasons for that is that if one of the problems with the discussion board, our, you know, our learners are using digital tools to communicate more than what this ever did. They're okay. not using this media because this <coughs> structure of it is very old. And blogging is something people do. You know? And there's all sorts of other varieties of engagement that people do digitally. And the, the more we can make this medium that we have built in and look like or function like something that they're already naturally doing as part of their daily practice, the more effectively it's going to work and the more likely they are to actually reach that organic engagement. But the tool is working against that because it's so much set up around a very nice version of post reply, post reply. So that idea of putting a blog out and revising it and improving it, I really like that. <laughs> and it be an online journal, which you've seen in other courses, which can be a, a similar 
Thanks, Lauren. So, kind of feeding off of the last few comments, I also read through the challenge part of this page that talks about the do's and the don'ts. Oh, yeah. And the most common thread in here reflects back on the amount that an instructor is or isn't interacting and interacting with the discussion, whether it's physically online or bringing it up in class. And I feel like there's this fine line between getting too involved so that the students don't want to participate because they feel they're being judged versus not involved enough where they wonder why are you even asking us to do this because it doesn't seem like you're paying attention to what we're writing anyway. So what is that happy medium so that there is that intrinsic motivation for them to continue to work through discussion? without being too intrusive. I had an instructor who had us do the Canvas, it wasn't Canvas at the time, it was D2L, it was, it was weird, and it was for us, but it was the uh, it was Panopticon mm -hmm. thing. He said he would respond to, you know, he would look at all of them and not respond to all of them. Now, did he look at all of them? We don't know. <laughs> But every once in a while, he, it's not a risk that we would take, right? So there was, it was sort of this threat of if you didn't do something well, you might get chosen that week and called out. Not the best intrinsic motivation there, but oh, certainly a way to manage and a way to say, I value enough that I'm, I'm going to look at some of them, not none of them, and I'm going to show you that. I'm going to look at some of them, but I just can't do them all. Karen and Naomi? So one thing I'm thinking about is, although this doesn't guarantee you've actually read it, but in the Canvas uh, to edit things, you can do a little, the allow liking, and one of the options is only graders can like. Oh. So perhaps that's one way to show students that you've read it, but don't necessarily need to interject. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's almost an acknowledgement. Right. Like in social media, that like isn't that I really like it. It's just that I, I saw it and and I, I value enough to like. To like it. Another thing I've done in the past, and I had people vehemently disagree with this practice, but I thought it was good. Um, I every at the end of every module, I in a in a wrap up announcement, I would highlight my name. Students, students who I thought made exceptional, exceptional posts. Mm -hmm. um, and they might have done things like really unique ideas and really creative or interesting resources they brought in, whatever. But I would call them out by name and say, this is our star poster, or a couple of people sometimes, for the week. And I felt like that, I guess, it both brought up that I was clearly paying attention. Um, and I also think it kind of gave students something to work for. I did see students kind of striving to do better as that kind of progressed. Um, so that was another way that I was recognizing them. And there's something about the, <clears throat> the, the social capital and the organic element and part of the let's make it more like a face-to-face -face discussion. In a face-to-face -face discussion, I put your name with your face. Name to face, right? Name, face, name, face, name, face. In online discussions, unless as an instructor I've said, I want you to have a profile picture up with you know a face that I can recognize, not you and your dog in a field 200 yards away. I don't or not an anime figure or Minecraft, whatever, but something with your face. And that way, when I read your post, I can be like, Oh yeah, that was Charles' post. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it, it, it's to your point of this is not an anonymous thing. I'm paying attention, and I can call you out. And whether I call you out by name or not is a choice that you can make. But somehow revisiting with the students to say this is important enough to me that I read <clears> through it and I looked at it, and now I'm going to respond. Maybe not to everything, but to some things. And then Naomi. Um, just sort of threading into that, I, I think that communicating to students, if you have a discussion component that primes an in-class conversation, just really clearly expressing that the their thoughts on the discussion forum have actively changed 
the direction that you want to take as an instructor in class. It's a really effective way of saying, thanks for engaging. I wanted to really focus in on this because it's something you talked about and that was great. I'm giving you agency. You have, you, you, what's the word, what's the word? you matter. Your choices matter. Your, what you write down in the posts matter and I'm going to respond. Thank you. All right, Molly. I'm just thinking about the reacting to people. I've, our lab uses Slack from pretty much all conversations, and I have found that I want that for all of my online conversations to be able to have the little emotes that are like, oh, I like that. Oh, that's funny. And it, it engages people and creates creativity, and it might be a, a way to do online it's more of, more of the face to face because yeah. you have literal faces. Hang on, turn and then talk. Yeah, well, just if you really want to know that you're looking, that the students know that you're looking at their posts and give them feedback in SpeedGrader. SpeedGrader makes it extremely easy for you to pull up their posts without having to dig through all of the threads and make a comment that you can have some canned ones and some then you can personalize them and really comment on their post what they did well or not and even link it through a rubric if you need to. So this takes some technical unpacking. You can have a discussion, but you can have an assignment that is a discussion. And if the assignment is the discussion, then you harness the ability to use SpeedGrader instead of going into the comments and having to track down some of onerously in Canvas, the, you know, which who did what and which one is which. It shows up in SpeedGrader. You can have all of somebody's comments all together. You can be like, oh, this person's making very good points or doesn't get it. Great for feedback, great for sort of helping you track are the students getting it, who needs help, who doesn't need help. But excellent point. Speed grade is speedy and we're pretty. Very good. Todd. Thank you, Molly, Dan, and your comments. Because um, you're helping me understand authenticity and this desire for it, which I have to admit, as someone who looks at the sociology of education, I find confusing. Um, if we want to Slack, let's use Slack. Uh, a Canvas discussion forum will never Right, replicate that experience. When I have students in Canvas, they're getting grades. And we, we probably ought to own that. And if we want different kinds of interaction, we better pick a, a tool that lets them produce a drama that, that actually. Because you can even have an I'm confused email. You know, like that doesn't make sense to me, which just prompts people to naturally yeah. explain more or expand on something. In some ways, is this getting back to Jim's question about are our students just changing? Are they evolving? Are their expectations different from what the tradition of formal education, of formal higher education has? And do we need to adopt, adapt? How do we change that? Can we, with all the legal and privacy and bureaucracy and costs of devices and things, like, what would it cost to get a Slack license on campus for that? That's a lot of machinery to move, a lot of policy to change. Yeah. Duncan. Well, for example. Memes and stuff. Yeah, one of them was like, I think I'm going to be doing the meme, right? In life, it's coming. That drill out of the stuff up. It's going to just be using one, one aspect of the game, and then we come on, push back, and it's your pretty much shut up. It's just the second time I've ever done it, and I was just still in my group, maintain their anonymity, and all kinds of people in the classroom. They want some worker coming at you in the classroom. It's one of the icon. This is my question about the, the profile picture? Yeah. Okay. So I'm very sensitive about not doing that now. Yep. Uh, so I play that out there too. But I do like, so you know, maybe anonymous is the way to go. Maybe that's why kids love these things because they can be anonymous and they should like, hey, pay attention to that. Right? Uh, yeah. I, I was actually thinking about Instagram. Like, it's cool. Like, you, know, the, you do like a mean thing, but it's in a discussion, right? And then you have all the importances of. Slack, I eat better, right? People will like and go, people will like and all of the things, you know, the whole nine yards, right? It'd be cool. Uh, sorry. Uh, I would like that. For some people, yeah. but other people would hate it. It's utopia no, dystopia. Be cool. Yes, but I do recommend it. There's all the statistics when you contribute to what way and how many people saw that. So, so I kind of display that to the students as often as I should to acknowledge. They're all these workers. 
and you know, I've always been on the mindset that I get the workers involved, but you know, why? I mean, they're getting a lot of benefit from working. I mean, that's cool. Right? I'm a <laughs> shy person, and I don't want to jump in. So that kind of discussion is not for credit. So I'm not like, you got to do this. Give me some advice. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's, that's really not a, what, a, what a real discussion is like. I mean, if you sit around with five people, if you want to be the five person, you just kind of listen. If you can, you can take a little bit in, but that's like a real authentic discussion. You're not forced to respond to two other people's. And this way, you just did one around the room is, you know, I can suffer that for you 25 minutes, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. not practical in that perspective. Yeah. That's what I got. Yeah. And this is where I think that going back to the anonymity versus um, the reality of an educational space, to Todd's point, when you're in Canvas, you're being graded, you're being watched. It's like the classroom. It's like, Okay, we can have our classrooms where we say you can wear, you know, a mask or the to be culturally uh, headgear, right? There's possibilities. Generally, there we sit down next to people, we see their faces, we see their um, who they are, and we don't always know their names unless we force them to have that. Um, spaces like Piazza, I love the idea of. Having a conversation occur there, it can be anonymous, it can be named, and it's it's all about their choice. Yeah, I find it nice as well, just does not find themselves in there anymore. Right. So um, they have a choice. I think, I, I think that the choice is great, especially there. Yeah. Sorry, I'm switching gears a little bit, but I'm Good. curious if anyone has tried um, like letting the students in the class kind of come up with how they want to run the discussions. Oh, yes. Sarah has. Yeah, there's, um, this isn't my idea or anything, but this was in a course that I was helping with um, where small groups in the class of about 30 students, so there's small groups, and then each week you have a discussion leader. The discussion leader is given instructions, and also the, the discussion leader, um, it's like they get a specific grade for leading that discussion because they also have to write up a little, little report that then they have to share with the whole class on what the discussion was and I it is really really effective I think um, even in their um, feedback and students feedback on it there were a couple students who got to do it a second time and they actually said I am so excited to be doing this again it, it was kind of surprising um, but putting the student in charge of giving feedback of encouraging their peers to participate and then knowing that they were going to like report on it and then it I don't know they they held <clears throat> each other a lot more and it was very effective. Imagine if that were standard practice from day one of your first year in college. By the time you were a junior or senior you would have so much empathy for instructors on how to do discussions. The tones, the issues of tone would have been figured out in some ways probably or at least addressed or at least more empathy about that. The idea that of, of the Peter you're questioning about how do we Respond. How do we get the teams to respond with everyone else? That report back at the end could be something that is posted in a full yeah. group discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so the final report was delivered to the professor. And then the professor would just copy and paste like a bunch of reports into an HTML page on Canvas. Yeah. And then students would go back and it's like a com compilation of notes. It's sharing all the group's work. And the professor didn't have to give any feedback in particular. To the discussion, back but, to the workload idea, but did grade each uh, group leader once a week. So it gives the students agency. It may, tells them that they're in charge in some ways. It distributes the work to the students, and we all know that whoever does the work does the learning. So that's great. Um, it addresses a lot of things. Beautiful idea. <clears throat> yes. So based on the student feedback activities and the discussion with the main problem was what was the point of that? Uh, there was such a disconnect between what was done on the on canvas and in the class. So uh, now with the, it's the second time that I do that, they meet in their group in their canvas uh, discussion group and they come up with either a question that they still have after their discussion or an issue that they want to raise. And that's kind of the guiding, uh, that guides the, the class discussion. So there is continuity, there is also why did you do that? And uh, that's, 
that, that's what it's like. Yeah, it's whatever you raise, we'll talk about. It's responsive, you matter, and it gives the students the agency of control. Cliff, is that your hand up? Or? Nope. Okay. All right. So we talked a little bit about, let's talk a little bit, well, tone. We don't have the emotion, emojis to be able to give the same amount of tone. There's also lack of inflection, there's lack of all kinds of stuff. Other ways that people are addressing that. Um, so one, you can use emojis in campus. Um, they're not like linked to you know response you put in with emojis in your. Response. All right, I can go online, copy whatever the page. Well, on a but... normal computer, if you hit the little Windows button in period, an emojis window pops up that you can select from. All right. right in line. I can't speak to Mac, so. In a normal computer, right? <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, because uh, I'm pretty sure this was in reference to instructor feedback. Uh, um, that was, yes. So using audio comments on the in the speed grader yeah. is one of the best discoveries I ever made, and I've had numerous students tell me how much they love having the audio comments. How many of you have tried audio comments? In SpeedGrader, they're great, and they don't have to be done in SpeedGrader necessarily because you can do it on your phone and then just upload to whatever that sound file is. It sets a pace for the students, so anything that you type, they can like scan through at whatever speed or ignore altogether. But if they have to listen to your voice at the pace that you're doing it, they it sort of moves in an analog version of it through those digital audio. But they also get the they get the inflection. They get that you're not yelling at them, mm -hmm. um, that you're reassuring in tone. It's a, a very fantastic way to give feedback. Naomi, and then I keep forgetting your name. Leah, sorry. Leah. I put a plug for giving an opt out just for um, students with auditory processing disorders. But I was really impressed um, when my, I, was, I asked my students kind of whether they wanted like a screencast or you know another kind of written comment or like what kind of feedback they wanted. They responded with the information I needed at exactly when I needed it, so it was, it was useful. Really good observation. Also, you ask them, and then you responded. Yeah, ask the students. Good, Leah. I'm kind of thinking that um, moderating other students' tones might be more of an issue, um, because like as the instructor, you'd have the semester to like build the rapport with the students, but like if the other students aren't engaging with each other, it's just an anonymous, like faceless person saying yeah. something that might be misinterpreted. And that's again why I really want them to have that picture there, and also why if you're going to do groups and you should. I don't want. I was about to say you should never do a large class, but I think that there are times when you can do a whole group discussion. I don't have any really good examples at the time, but I'm sure that they exist. Um, but in the small groups, if you have them. Evolve and iterate. You know, the first discussion that you have between five or six people probably going to be stilted, superficial, not so great. The second week better, the third week better, the fourth week better. By the middle of the semester, they should know each other pretty well, trust each other, or at least trust that other people will react in a certain way. It's part of just sort of knowing and expecting things. But you're right, that anonymous. The most toxic discussions on campus or forums on campus are what's anonymous, fully anonymous. Piazza, again, that anonymity, and you need to tell this to your students if you use it, is for other students, it is not for you. You can always see who they are, and if they're acting like jerks, you need to intervene early on. I saw a hand over there. Uh, so there's a study that we have in the TV sheet from a second page, she's way tall. Um, this professor did a parallel study of audio discussion boards with text-based discussion boards in the graduate level course. And so students could do whichever one they wanted to give comments or their posts in sort of as an audio file or as um, written. It was a pretty fascinating um, comparison about tone, which we've talked about, tone, intonation. And she did it over the course of an entire semester. And she had heard from students talk a lot about um, the community building within the course or something like that. Um, but the comparison between which one's better um, is still a jury result. And it's contextual, right? For that class versus another class, but something to try in part of your experiment of moving things forward and helping these technologies become 
better and not giving up on them altogether because sometimes we have to use the tools that we are given. We have just two minutes left. Are there things that we have not talked about here or new things that came up that you want us to build on the, the cloud knowledge for Karen? I think a general comment is one, don't feel like your discussions have to be the same. And I'm, I'm speaking to a fully online class, I guess, in most of my comments. So just, that sounds very really nice. They don't all have to be the same. They can differ over the course. Um, you know, I, I know I saw you have David Dwyer linked somewhere in here, right there actually. Um, and he taught his discussions, they start off with a bit more guidance, more scaffolding, and they get a bit more, you take it on your own as he goes on. Um, so that's one thing that they don't all have to be the same, and that I think addresses a lot of some of the issues anyway that I've heard. Um, also, Um, think about what the purpose of your discussion is. Oftentimes, a discussion is meant to engage a learning process, not to be a summative assessment. Yes. So that's really important too, right? And so when you really have clarity on what the purpose, the function that your discussion is serving for your course overall, really helps you to design it better. And share that purpose with your students, yeah. so they so they know why you're doing this as well. And that gets rid of a lot of the ug, a lot of the why am I doing this? This is busy work. This feels stupid. The biggest frustration, and I just talked to a hundred graduating seniors about technology practices and learning yesterday and the day before. The biggest thing that came out was they're frustrated with technology when it doesn't work, or they don't know how to use it or they don't know what the instructor wants them to do it's this i don't understand the content i'm happy to do what you want me to do but i don't understand how to do it or what you want me to do and that's frustrating and then that's when they look at what other people have done and said same i agree because it's a defense mechanism <clears throat> we're out of time thank you for our conversation really appreciate it again there's a lot more about this topic that we can't get to. Um, if you would, on your way out, just hit a couple of boxes and on, on the reflection sheet, and if you're willing to stick around for a little bit longer, I'm presenting on what an active teaching lab is um, at a, a conference in Seattle, a national conference, and I'm biased, so please give me your input on what makes this